characteristics of the reverberation signal, it's going to depend on the room properties. So the architecture, the room dimensions, the, um, the surface textures and materials that are used. And then if we just look at a very simple room here, top view of the, that's just a shoebox room with a listening position and a sound source position. And then we can look at the um, reflections here, just a, a for an, as an example of 3D first order reflections. And we can map the intensity and the time delays here, and also the intensities, the, the directional structure of the intensities of the uh, banks of incidence of the uh, reflections. Um, and then we get these intensities here according to um, absorption air and also absorption of re um, reflection points. And then if we keep everything the same, and the only thing that we change is the sound source location, we can see again, just an example here of the first order reflection, we can see that we get a different structure both here in time but also for the directional structure of uh, where the reflections come from. So we get different time delays, different intensities, and different um, directional structure. So going back and forth here, we have some classification on this side and then on the other side, and we see that we have these different structures. And that's really the, the key point to recognize is that not only what I said earlier is true that um, the reverberant characteristics can depend on the room dimensions and the room properties, but also on where the sound source is in the room relative to the listener. And then if we compare that to how we use reverberation as a mixing tool, what we see is that the most common approach is to have some kind of process, in this case, a plugin um, at an uh, aux track that we send dry audio signals to. And what happens is that they get summed at the input stage here, and then they get all processed um, according to the same algorithm or impulse response, or in general, just the, the same set of rules. So this is this uh, dissonance here that I found is that the way we use reverb as a mixing tool doesn't fully reflect what is actually happening in the real world. And then the solution for this is to use position-based reverberation, meaning that the um, spectral, temporal, and directional structure or the position of the reverb signal is going to depend on where the sound source is located listen, uh, relative to the listening position. And of course, in mixing, how we position sounds is through panning. So that means that we have to take the panning data or the panning information of the dry audio tracks into account when creating the uh, reverb signal. And that also means that each audio track needs to have, to have its own processor that can react to the panning position of the audio track. And then, before <coughs> moving on to the implementation, I want to quickly talk about two more things here. This uh, research product that I um, found from the uh, University of Victoria, where they recorded in a concert hall, they recorded impulse response and surround at uh, 10 different source locations on stage. And then they modeled that into a um, software where the user could place audio or clips in these different uh, locations and listen to what they sound like in different positions on the stage. And what's interesting here also is this quote from the introduction where they say, the ultimate goal is to fool the blind so for the listener to believing that they are attending a live performance. And that really shows what this uh, position-based preparation is meant for this really meant to create this ultra-realistic image of, you know, of, of a sonic uh, event. And then um, the second thing here is this, this uh, plugin called MIR Pro. It also works with surround impulse responses, and the user can set these icons here. It's a little bit hard to see, but you have these icons, and you can move them around on, on the stage area, and they all represent different audio tracks, and um, they're going to be treated with different uh, surround impulse responses depending on where the user sets them. So common problems that I found um, while looking at prior work, research projects and also in products that are available is that the, the common approach is for the software to take control of, or the, the user uses the software to set the ratio of dry and the road and sound. And then the software is going to control uh, through these positioning systems that we've seen here with the, with the plugin, for example, is going to control the panning of both the dry sound and the wet sound. And um, I think that's a problem because even though panning is kind of a simple process, it's still a very important decision that we make uh, during mixing. And I think that should be left to the mixing engineer to make that decision. Um, and then the reverb software should be able to react to the panning position, either coming from the host software or provided by the user. And then the other thing is that all these projects, all these products, they always focus on the um, area in front of the listener, so mainly the stage area. And um, I think the great benefit of surround is really that we can create these immersive experiences where we can have instruments behind the listener. And I think 
we should be able to have algorithms or impulse responses ready for these planning positions as well. There should be normal limitations. And this was the goal, so I, I made this, I, I called the method position based around reverberation, PBSR for short. And my goal for this was, um, like I said, to be able to ac uh, accept the planning data for the dry audio signal from the user or from the whole software, and then be able to react to that. So the um, mixing engineer could use whatever tool he likes to use, if it's the Pro Tools panel, for example, um, for the planning process. Um, and then also for the software to be able to, uh, to have no limitations in terms of uh, planning positions, so be able to, to uh, react to any and all planning positions. And then the third one, uh, specifically for this project, for this thesis, was to uh, recreate the characteristics of um, a real existing room. So that brings me to the implementation part. Um, that was uh, in two parts. The first one was to create a set of impulse responses that captures the uh, properties of a room. And then the second one was to uh, actually develop the software. So the, um, the impulse response recording that was done here in the building in Low Theater. I had this grid that covered pretty much the entire room. The center of the grid is where the microphone was, that was in the third row here of the seating area. And then um, the grid was defined in a cylindrical coordinate system, um, and at 24 source positions here with the, uh, you can see the green dots here indicate source positions, with uh, 45 degree angle steps, and then per angle I did three um, measurements um, at three, six, and nine meters distance. Um, so the loudspeaker was, uh, was positioned here in these green positions, uh, one at a time, and then the recording was made, and then it was moved to the next uh, green spot here, and then another impulse response was recorded. I used, uh, for the microphone setup, I used the Polylinear Pentagon, um, which is pretty much an inverse of the uh, speaker arrangement. So um, we have 30 de degree angle here in the front, and then 110 degrees for the uh, microphone for the rear Um They're all located on a circle, and then I used a stereo base for the front channels of 25 centimeters. And um, I had to re use windscreens here because it was getting noise from the ventilation system. Um, I used uh, directional microphones, cardioid condenser microphones, uh, DPA 4011s, and the input signal is a logarithmic sine suite, and that was played back through a Genelec speaker here. You can see that, for example, here, that's the speaker um, and the mic set up at um, an angle of zero degrees and a distance of six meters, and then here, for example, at uh, 225 degrees and nine meters all the way in the corner. Okay, so before um, um, I move on to the software implementation, I want to talk about what we can expect in terms of the psychoacoustic cues that we're going to get from these, from using these position-based uh, impulse responses. And what, can, what you can see on the left side here is uh, a set of three surround impulse responses with the surround channels from top to bottom. So we have center, left, right, left, surround, right, surround, uh, from st uh, three different angles and three different uh, distances as well. And then these red bars here, they uh, indicate the arrival times of the direct sound. And um, so according to the Haas effect of the law of cross wavefront, we can expect from these patterns that we get um, that these impulse responses are going to uh, result in localization at these angles. Um, so if we have then if we have audio, dry audio pan to these locations and we use it in combination with these impulse responses, we can expect the, the localization of the dry audio can kind of be supported by the localization that we get from the um, reverberant sound. But on the other hand, if we, if we imagine that we have, again, audio plans of these positions, we just use a generic, or let's say just the first one for all of them, then for the second two positions, it would actually be contradicting to the localization of the, um, of the direct sound. And then on the right side here, the clarity index, from looking at the literature, that seems to be a, um, a Q for distance estimation and uh, distance perception. And um, what that is is the, the ratio of early sound energy and late sound energy arriving at the listening position um, before 50 milliseconds or bef uh, before and after 50 milliseconds and before and after 80 milliseconds in the case of C80. And that ratio is uh, expressed in dB. So I calculate that for the recordings at zero degrees um, at three different distances, see at three, six, and nine meters. You can see how that goes down. That suggests that using these impulses as for, uh, to create a, a reverb signal from these different distances is going to um, uh, can be used as a distance cue for the listener. It's, it's going to be perceived as a different 
distances. Okay, and then um, a different question is, what is panning really? Um, what, do, what do we perceive when we change the panning position, when we take the dot and the photos pan and, and, and move it around? And visually, from looking at the photos pan, it would, it would suggest that we're moving a sound from here to here, or that it's very precise, but what's actually happening, and that's, um, I, I found it in the literature, and I first found that from my own personal experience, is that what's more precise is the angle, but the distance isn't really very precisely perceived. And that has to do with the phantom sources that rely on reflection with multiple sound um, loudspeakers, and they don't create these kind of reflection patterns in the listening room that lets the brain really precisely localize them or estimate the distance. But we still get the angle um, relatively precisely. And um, so the, the idea here is to use the panning position of the dry audio to calculate the angle and then let the user in the reverb software add a, um, a distance parameter. Um, so that kind of gets into the area of where the reverb is kind of becomes part of the panning, it's kind of distance-based panning almost. Um, so that's what we have. We have the process panning here, and the user then um, in this format sets the, the panning here. We have the left, right, and front, rear, and that gets converted in the code to an angle, and the user adds the distance in the software. And then one thing to, to notice um, for this conversion here to the angle is what, that's important is if we take this dot here in the process panel, we put it all the way here in the upper right corner, um, meaning that the sound would only be reproduced by the front right speaker. Um, visually, that would suggest that we get the sound from a 45 degree angle here. But that's actually not true because the front right speaker is at a 30 degree angle. And the same is true if we put the dot in the lower right corner, so it's all coming out of the right surround speaker. It would suggest an angle of 135 degrees, when it's actually 110. So in this conversion to the angle, this kind of distortion of this coordinate system has to be into, uh, taken into account as well. So um, I did the programming in MATLAB, and um, made this application where the user inputs a mono audio file and the panning data of the dry audio that he used in the whole software, and then he adds the distance parameter and the output file is five mono audio files that get re-imported into Pro Tools and pan to the corresponding speakers. And each group is going to give you one um, surround reverb uh, signal for this uh, input signal. So that has to be done for each audio track separately. Now the next question is, what happens if we have a position that we don't have an impulse response recording for? So a position that is not one of these green dots that could be here somewhere. And the answer to that is in the code I use uh, weighted, linear weighted interpolation. So the software goes and um, finds these surrounding points that are on the grid for which we have impulse response recordings. So I say we want to get an approximation of what the um, impulse response would be at this point here, PA. Then in the code we get we, we find these uh, surrounding impulse responses. Each one is scaled with a weighting factor. You can see here for the point P1 we have the weighting factor w1 and how that is calculated. So each one is scaled with its own weighting factor and then summed to get an approximation of what the um, impulse response would be at that position. Okay, so this is uh, what the what the interface looks like. Um, the user can copy the Pro Tools um, panning information here, enter the distance here and load an audio file and then Convolve is going to create the output file. There's additional features here, verify position, that's just going to check that the, the, the distance that was entered is actually um, in the range of the minimum and maximum distance of the, of the grid. Convert to angle, it's going to display the angle here, and this get interpolation data is going to show the user which um, impulse responses are going to be taken into account for the interpolation. So that could be done in the background, but it just makes it easier to, for, for testing purposes to follow what the code is really doing. Okay, and the uh, Tone Meister album production. I did that uh, with a friend of mine, his name is Andrew Weiss. He was here in the composition program at NYU. And uh, I think over the course of uh, six weeks, we had three full days in Dolan here for recording. And our idea was to kind of have these different approaches for each day. So for example, for one day, we decided to come to this to be completely unprepared, just not discuss anything, no idea what we're gonna do, and just try to come up with something. And then another approach was to do the exact opposite.
was it where I wrote the piece, and we had demos that we sent back and forth, we discussed everything, and coming to the studio, we knew exactly what we were going to do. Um, and then I mixed the music here in Dolan and Surround. So you can see here, it's just from two different drum sessions that we did. Um, it's from recording uh, electric bass and electric guitar. Okay, and then what kind of connects this section to the previous two is the fact that for um, a part uh, of the Tomaster music for this section, I used this uh, position based MATLAB uh, tool that I made um, as the only <coughs> source for, for reverb. Um, and what I found is, of course, the drawback is you have to export other Pro Tools for e each audio track, um, create the um, reverb signals, and then import that back into Pro Tools. That does slow the process down a little bit. But once that is done, it's kind of convenient to work with. It's really like working with uh, room microphones with a nice addition that you can really um, decide how much each audio track contributes to the, the sum of the uh, room microphones. Um, and for me, personally, while working with it, I found that it did improve in those areas that I hoped it would improve, these aspects, uh, psychoacoustic aspects like localization, and just uh, made it easier to imagine the acoustic environment that was in. So then, for future work, um, like I said, to me personally, it seems like the current version is, is show, um, shows promise for further development. Um, it's workable as it is, it can be used to mixing. Obviously, the next step would be to make it into a plugin and um, get rid of that uh, process of exporting and importing and just make it easier to use and faster to use also. And then, of course, the third thing would be to have subjective listening tests to try and quantify what the impact of, of using position-based uh, recuperation on aspects like position of localization, spaciousness, and other, uh, and other aspects of the case. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, Tice, for your uh, presentation. And um, again, thank you for your uh, great work all these uh, years, <laughs> well, three or so, two at least, uh, working in the studio with us. And um, uh, I enjoyed reading your, your thesis, very well written, and um, filled in uh, some, some gaps in my knowledge about reverb. And uh, I appreciate the work you're doing um, because, uh, as we've spoken about many times, you know, decorrelating signals is the key to not only stereo surround and uh, multi-channel VR, all this. So it's a very timely uh, subject to get away from level panning. Anything we can do to get there is great. Um, so um, with that in mind, I have a question, which is, uh, in your thesis, you did um, some nice um, um, quantitative analysis of your results that mm -hmm. some weren't in your presentation today, but yeah. for the audience, I want to ask you a few things. Um, and uh, I was wondering, um, what, what would you say or um, what's your opinion or what did you learn about the relationship between timbre and, and more time-based uh, processing going on? Because typically reverberation is referred to as RT60. We have a little bit of EQ. Mm -hmm. But as your research showed, um, that uh, timbre has quite a bit to do with uh, the reverberator. Mm -hmm. um, and with that in mind, did you feel that using this reverberator transported you to low theater, or was it more uh, just a nice effect? So, so part one, how would you weigh timbre to time-based um, processing as far as reverberators go? Mm -hmm. And two, uh, tell us about the overall effect. Was it a concert realistic effect or just kind of a, a fancy <coughs> reverberator? Okay. Uh, to actually start with the second part, um, we did recordings there for concert recordings in, in Mono, so I, I knew what music in the room would sound like. Uh, I think we did actually multiple sessions there. Um, and then from using it now for the, for the mixing, I do feel like it really recreates the room, especially if there's not too many sound sources, uh, but also not just one or two. If it's like three or four sound sources positioned around you, um, and each one's treated with the according uh, impulse response for the uh, according position. It really does feel like low theater. Um, it's, it's a very precise recreation of, of that room. Um, it will definitely be interesting to see where the limits are, how small and dry a room can get, or how large and, and, and reverberant the room uh, could be to still really, um, get that image. Uh, and then the other question is, I guess, um, 
in, in what's interesting in low is that there's very distinct early reflections because of the large reflective surfaces that we have in the, on the walls. So there, time is really um, the main, uh, the, the first thing that we realized when, when I was listening to those recordings. Mm -hmm. We really get if the, the sound source behind me, then the first thing I get is the reflection from the opposite side, uh, very distinct reflection. Um, but then in terms of timbre, I feel like that really um, brings across the different materials that are used. So if, if I have a sound source that is very close to the, uh, or like more in an area, like I showed earlier, where it's in the corner and the back area, mm -hmm. it's all reflective, then we get this brighter sound, distinct reflections. And then if it's near the curtains, then uh, the timbre changes. And that also brings across the kind of where the materials, the different materials that are used in the room, and where they are. Around. And I guess that also um, is part of why we get this precise picture, because we can really see if we kind of sound source to the front left, there must be the curtain somewhere there, because it's much darker and less reflective than if we put it on the stage or behind it. Yep. Okay. Um. And uh, a little bit about your interpolation um, algorithm. Um, how many, I mean, did you feel five channels was enough to interpolate, or did you feel like when you were running your interpolation, it went from, you know, working great to, oh, God, we're in a hole now, to, um, you know, how, how effective was that means? Um, yeah. I feel like it, um, the way it is right now, it's pretty effective, especially for the fact that I only, because um, of time constraint, was able to use uh, 24 recording positions. Uh, if I had, if I would have had two days, or uh, it was also the first time that I did this, so it was hard to, uh, before starting it, realizing how much I could do mm -hmm. uh, in the time frame. So I, I made the grid in a way that I could make sure that I could get it done in a day. Um, so, of course, if I have these cells, it's a bit smaller by using more, um, in post-response recordings, then that makes the interpolation more precise. But I feel like uh, in a room like Low Theater, it seems to be relatively even. So the changes here between even in the outer cells, so this is six meters and nine meters, um, this area is still small enough, or the changes in this area is still small enough that the interpolation does make sense. So it doesn't, it doesn't feel like there's any uh, inconsistencies um, uh, when, when using this interpolation, even if it's, if it's right in the middle here where it's kind of far from all the other inputs as well. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like it, it did work very well. Thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, impressive work. Uh, I would follow up on the question about the interpolation. So what evidence do you have that linear interpolation is the right thing to do here? Uh, why would it be linear? Why, why did you pick linear? Do you know that linear yeah. is the best thing to do? Or? Um, um, it might not be the best thing to do. It was, in, at that time, the most, that not, not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but the, the one that uh, was easiest handled by the code, um, definitely. Because um, I was getting to the point where the code, uh, there was so much going on in the code that it took um, a long time to process. So I was also, also looking for ways to keep it um, workable, to, to make it um, short enough, the processing time, so the user can actually use it, um, instead of waiting, you know, having lunch break to just to get the rework uh, process. Um, so that's that's why I uh, chose linear interpolation, just to keep it at that basic level. And it was also it would also be interesting for future work maybe to look into that and see if um, if I could get away with a larger grid and then a more complex interpolation system um, to use less impulse response uh, impulse response recordings uh, but a more complex interpolation. Because it strikes me, that if, if you can't hear much difference between, you know, within that space, you could just snap to the nearest point. And that, would be, any that would be another thing to do, yeah. Because um, um, the other thing that strikes me is that in 99% of the listening environments, listeners don't put the speakers where they're supposed to, and they don't sit where they're supposed to. Right, that's <laughs> so true. But, um, I mean, that's, I guess that's the fault of the listener. And uh, this system definitely is made for uh, a setup that is according to the rules with the listener sitting in this spot, well, definitely. I mean, this, this effect, um, going to these lengths to create these position-based recuperation systems and uh, using them is, is definitely only worth it if we have a system that is set up in a way that is according to the ITU um, uh, 
the surround speaker setup and also with the listener in the right position. Definitely. But it strikes me that the only place that you have some degree of confidence about that is in the VR. Because you know where the noises are coming from in the virtual space. Mm -hmm. And you know where the listener is in the virtual space. Right. So then it gets you to kind of what you were just talking about, uh, computation load. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how fast is it? Could you do this in a VR system and have it work? Um, I think it could be done. It's the way it is right now, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, it's, it, I mean, for a for a long signal, if, it, if it's on read time, it's of course only done for small chunks, but right now, the way I use it for mixing is exporting uh, signals of uh, two minute lengths, and that's a, a couple of seconds. So mm -hmm. It is fast. How long does it take to compute? Uh, a couple, just a couple of seconds. For, for a two minute a input seconds. file, it's a couple of seconds. It's still pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk about a nature field spectral enhancement approach for professional grade virtual reality environments. So first I'll start talking about the motivations for this project. Um, as you can see on screen, there's been uh, recent technological trends to the size reduction of, technolo of technological devices. Uh, this is just 20 years of development, take us from 16 megahertz in CPU to 2.9 gigahertz. Um, and this, this trend has also impacted the pro audio world. It's no surprise that um, a good amount of, of award-winning uh, albums that are out there are mixed only in the box as opposed to with analog gear. And uh, the reason for this uh, is portability, that you can take your uh, working device with you to wherever you go, uh, budget, of course, um, and um, enhanced functionality, which, uh, for instance, in this particular case, you can recall every single button well, in an uh, analog game console, you cannot. So this made me thought, well, what's missing to take a pro audio environment and just take it with you uh, on a headset or the Oculus and, and a pair of headphones? And the answer for this is um, a pro audio simulation. 
which means having a reliable environment and that it's uh, stable enough so that uh, an audio engineer can use it. And uh, for, for that particular reason, there has been a considerable amount of efforts to do enhancement approaches uh, to, to get to this ideal simulation. I'm going to talk about uh, specifically uh, the spectral enhancement approaches. I have classified them in, in, two basic, um, in two basic categories. The first one is measurement-based methods, and the second one is uh, aesthetics-based methods. The first one, the measurement base, is such as the work by Hawksford in 2002, where he realized that uh, the coloration of the signal uh, comes from the correlated information of the HRDFs, or the mid version of the HRDFs, while the side version of it uh, gives the spectral cues to localized objects. So basically what he did is an MS version of the HRDFs, and then deconvolve uh, the, spectral, um, the spectral frequency to itself, so that he obtained a flat line. So in theory, that uh, he obtained no coloration from the simulation. However, practically, he had some ringing and unwanted artifacts. In the other hand, uh, work by Silso in 2002, which is the aesthetics-based methods. Um, what, what he did was uh, in, he asked, he commissioned the engineer that tunes DC electronic input responses to select uh, HRTFs from a pool of HRTFs. And, uh, and then he chose also headphone compensation cure for that same HRTF. And then he tuned it to uh, words of the author what sounded best. So um, he didn't run statistically, uh, statistical results on, on, on what he found, fortunately, but uh, uh, he said that there, it was very, very uh, successful. And uh, at the end, uh, this can be a little unstable in terms of who's tuning the system. There's no reference, it's just tuning to the aesthetic taste of the tuner. So I address, um, I address this issue by uh, proposing a method that it's a mid-ground between this both, uh, these two approaches. And uh, to do that, I, um, I ask uh, a professional audio engineer, an expert listener, to tune his own HRTFs, but not only to what sounded best to him, but actually to tune them according to the real environment, A, B between the real environment and uh, the simulation. Um, here is the methodology A of my thesis, which is I took personalized HRTFs, as I mentioned, by putting binaural capsules in the engineer, and then I set up an array of six speakers in front of him, and I did uh, some markings in the wall to mark the azimuth angle. So for instance, if I was taking the HRTF for minus 90 degrees, he had a laser, a bite bar wheel laser, and he would turn his head around to minus 90, and I would run a sign sweep from every single speaker. And then I did that same thing for all the azimuth angles. So at the end, I had an HRTF, uh, an HRTF set that covered uh, the frontal plane of the engineer. Uh, for those HRTFs also looking to get the most transparent HRTF possible, I did free field compensation and headphone compensation too. So uh, those HRTFs, after compensating for, for, the, for, uh, for the apparatus, I, I implemented on, on Unity, on a simulation uh, of the same room where the engineer was. Uh, uh, this was Dolan, the live room in Dolan, which was a professional grade environment. And um, he was able to AV an audio uh, through the simulation and through the real speaker, and then use an equalizer to tune it to match them. So at the end, what I got from this step of the process was an EQ curve that would, in the, in the ears of the audio engineer, would match the HRTFs in the simulation to the real environment. So uh, further in my study, I uh, did a listening test where uh, basically I used four stimuli, which, which were drums, uh, vocals, full band, and cello. And I, I did different versions of it. In this particular case, I'm using as an example the drum, the drum stimuli. So uh, the, the aim of this study was to test how would this curve uh, be perceived by other listeners and if it was transposable to other systems such as a, a dummy head. So what I did was four versions which were uh, I extracted 0, 20 and minus 30 degrees HRTFs from the dummy head and the engineer's head. And I did the four versions by one of them adding the enhancement curve that the engineer designed and one with only headphone compensation. Compensation, sorry. And the same thing I did for, for the, HRTF, the HRTFs of the engineer. And what the listeners were asked to do was to compare those, uh, those versions that were randomized, and of course it, were, uh, it was blind test, uh, to compare them to a known reference, which was uh, the same um, monofile, in this case, uh, drums. 
but we know spatial quality is just regular panning and uh, headphone compensation so that they would be comparing the same uh, frequency. Oh, and uh, the study was performing Dolan to keep it consistent with, with the visual stimuli. I use the following, uh, the following GUI, uh, which was based on MATLAB. And uh, as you can see, those are the four uh, hidden sounds that I talked before, and they could play the reference. And they rated in a scale of zero to seven. Um, the listeners were asked to, to uh, grade for these three particular uh, characteristics, which were spectral naturalness, how realistic it sounds, externalization, if it sounds inside the head or coming as outside the headphones, and uh, coloration, which was uh, how the frequency spectrum was preserved. Uh, due to the spectral, um, uh, to the spectral content, spatial content. I mean, so uh, this uh, when I obtained the data, I did a general factorial regression to analyze the data. Um, I used the, the these factors, which were the dummy head uh, against the human head, process and process being one with the enhancement curve that the engineer designed and one without it, and I used the instruments, which were the four instruments that I mentioned before, and the three locations. This. Um, the results from, from this stage were that in terms of naturalness, there was a general improvement of 8.3%. Of course, it was statistically relevant uh, with a p-value of 0 0.008. Uh, in terms of externalization, uh, there was no significant value in general or in particular, but I'll, I'll talk a little more about that in uh, future in this uh, presentation. But uh, uh, in coloration, there was no general trend. Uh, so in general, the coloration was not affected. However, there was a, a, a significant relationship between the dummy head and the process and unprocess factors. To analyze this in depth, I run what I call a, a specific factorial regression, which was pretty much I took two of the factors and then realized a general factorial regression just for those particular values. What I was trying to find is how would my process affect that particular situation? So in this case, for instance, I used the dummy head versus the process, and then I run another uh, additional general factorial regression for the human head. And from those, from the specific uh, specific general factorial regression, I also run it uh, for instruments uh, versus the process, and of course locations uh, versus the process. Every single location and every single instrument. And from 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 that uh, specific uh, analysis. I, uh, I found that the human head had a, 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 a statistically significant value with an improvement of 11.1% in coloration. Uh, this was just for the human head, not for the dummy head. And also, uh, there was a statistically significant uh, result for drums and any other instrument or any other location in terms of coloration. And uh, in terms of naturalness, uh, again, the human head was the only one that uh, draw statistically significant results with a 15.9% improvement. And um, uh, in terms of naturalness, uh, I had uh, a statistically significant result on 20 degrees and the full band only, no other instrument. In addition to the, the, uh, the listening test of the entire subject pool, I also run the, exper the experiment through the engineer that designed the curve. The idea of this was to compare uh, more or less how was his perception against the perception of, of the full uh, subject pool. I didn't, of course, include uh, the, the engineer on the subject pool because he, he was totally biased. He knew what was going on. So uh, after running um, statistical, no, sorry, not statistical analysis, but mean analysis, I found out that there was only one uh, factor uh, that the negative, uh, there was a negative factor that um, was coloration in the process, as you can see here, the blue line is the process version, while the red line is the unprocessed. So he, in, um, in other words, he preferred, in terms of coloration, he preferred the unprocessed version in general. And he thought there was uh, an improvement in externalization and an improvement on naturalness because of the cure. In addition, uh, there was, very, uh, there was an, an interesting result that showed that there was an improvement on his HRDFs, as you can see here, uh, 1.9 to 1.8. Improvement. These are the means, 1.9 and 1.8, and there was a considerable decrease on quality in terms of coloration for the dummy head. This, in, uh, again, in years of the audio engineer, not the uh, subject pool. And one of the most relevant results from from this uh, study was that uh, 
the engineer actually preferred or, or thought it was more natural the HRTFs that he saw in HRTFs. This sort of like uh, took me to drive conclusions that there might have been some external factors uh, that um, might have influenced the, the quality or the original quality of the simulation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, an analysis of the results is first of all, there is a clear disconnection between externalization and the curve. So the curve drew no statistically significant, there were no trends in any particular situation or in general, there were no connection between uh, the spectral modification and externalization. In addition, um, it, it also, the, this analysis suggests that the curve is not transposable to other systems, such as the dummy head. Uh, this is because the, the dummy head was no statistically significant in any particular situation. And uh, uh, there was an external influence on the integrity of the, of the simulation, as I mentioned before. Uh, there was a clear preference for the dummy head over, over the, the uh, personalized HRTF, not only for the entire subject pool, for, but for the engineer itself. This contradicts the, the literature, and, and that's the reason I'm, uh, I can conclude this. And in addition from the specific analysis, the enhancement in drums for coloration, and uh, not for, for, uh, for naturalness, and enhancement for the full band in naturalness, but not in coloration, can, uh, can possibly be explained uh, because the drums, for instance, have a core haptic component. Uh, that in terms of naturalness will be really important so that the listener can feel that the drums are real. And in terms of coloration, well, they were focusing on, for instance, the kick drum. If the kick drum was consistent to the reference, then that uh, sort of drove the, the, the tendency to, to the enhancement. And the same thing on the full band in terms of naturalness. Uh, the full band had the widest spectrum of all the stimuli. So uh, perhaps there might have been some uh, listeners that were focusing only on the bass, and the bass was consistent, so they would say, okay, this is enhanced. Uh, however, there might have been other listeners that were listening for the high end only, and that have probably sort of like take the trends to, to other situation that was not statistically significant. Of course, there, have, there needs to be more research on this particular situation to draw uh, generalized conclusions. And uh, also for the 20 degree angle, I found that um, Despite the, uh, the compensation curve, despite my approach, as you can see, there was a clear preference for minus 30 degrees in terms of naturalness. Uh, and uh, in terms of coloration, 20 degree and minus 30 degree were pretty similar. This made me thought that there could be some possible relationship between uh, the if effectiveness of the enhancement approach and the original thought of the listener about that particular angle. Um, so in conclusion, this, this study complements the literature by presenting uh, a middle ground between measurement-based and aesthetic-based uh, methods. And uh, not only presents some interesting relationships and, and, and analysis over this particular experiment, but it also proposes a roadmap for future studies on, on deliberate spectral modifications. So uh, for future works, um, transposability to similar systems, as I mentioned before, there was a, a clear difference between the dummy head, the spectral qualities of the dummy head, and the obtained HRTFs. So perhaps transposing that same uh, curve from the personalized HRTFs to something that it's similar could draw, uh, in my opinion, good results. Um, in addition, the extrapolation of the approach, meaning instead of uh, the engineer trying to match spectral qualities of the signal, the engineer trying to match, for instance, direct to reverberant ratio, or maybe externalization, or, or other factors of, where they, uh, the engineer could even tune the room in that sense. Um, so another, another approach that could be uh, developed from, from, from this work is uh, having input dependent or smart systems, which would follow the current trends in the pro audio industry, which is the system could analyze the input of the signal saying, okay, I'm getting transient sounds, or I'm getting, for instance, a zero degree angle, or I'm getting 20 degree angle, and the engineer could design different cures depending on those particular situations and those particular angles. In addition, it would be very interesting to explore the relationship between the spectral modification rate and uh, the effect size, meaning if, if, uh, if I would 
if I would make this particular curve more prominent, or I uh, would modify it if the engineer boosted 3 dBs, I would make it 6 dBs, for instance. Would that make it better, or would that just decrease the simulation quality? Um, and at last, of course, uh, the natural step is analyzing this particular uh, approach, but in a, in a dynamic situation. Right now, the listeners didn't have a head tracking device. Uh, however, a natural next step would be to have uh, a head tracking device and so that the listeners could move their head around and evaluate every possible situation. Um, and of course, have all, not only spectral qualities, but also location qualities. If the location is affected by the spectral changes or if it's uh, consistent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ernesto. I uh, really enjoyed reading your thesis. I thought it was very well written, and it was a, a real pleasure to, to read it. And, um, and thank you also for your presentation. Um, I think this is a very timely topic, because everybody is now kind of striving to find that, that better sound. And that better sound means so many different things to different people. And you know, all we want at the end is to have that, that better button that will work for everything. But, um, uh, but as we all know, it's very subjective, and that better button means different things to, to different people. So this is a really nice um, step in, in a direction to kind of figure out what can make sound sounds better, especially that more and more people are listening uh, through headphones or, or earphones, um, and where the quality of the sound is more limited. Um, so I have a few uh, questions and also some comments about your document. My first question to you is, when when you were doing your experiments, did you uh, did you present the sounds uh, multiple times to to your subjects, or I mean, did you? Because su subjects tend to answer differently, even if they're listening to the same thing. So sometimes, you know, you ask this, do you prefer A or B? One time, you may get the answer, well, I prefer A, and then five minutes later, they prefer B. Did you do any analysis of of within subject variability? I, I didn't do particular statistical analysis uh, within subjects, but I did uh, sort of like a training section in the beginning of, 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 the, uh, of the experiment. I would go through uh, with the listener, I would open a dummy, uh, a dummy GUI, and I would play the audios and make sure that they knew what was going on, and they were able also to uh, make me any questions at any point in time. And of course, the, the test was long, it was very, very long, and there was tons of information. So um, at the end, there were, uh, my, my idea was to evaluate for every possible situation. So they were evaluating for zero degrees, but not only for one instrument, but for four instruments. And they were listening to it in different approaches, different situations. And then they would grade that one for naturalness. Then they would grade it for externalization. So they definitely had some, uh, uh, they were uh, familiar with the sound already by the time they started doing the experiment. But you didn't ask the same question to the same subject twice, just to see if no. there's consistency. Okay. No, I did not. I, I um, only uh, did the particular question. And that pretty much also because of length. Uh, I had to take out some like uh, questions. And I had to take one instrument out, too. Because, I mean, by, as by now, it was 50 minutes, the, the listening test. There was a, a listener that took an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if, you know, the room, uh, it's difficult to get for five days in a row. Of course. Yeah. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, it also make, made sense to me that extralization wasn't affected by spectral coloration because, uh, I mean, in literature, and I'm sure th through your, your testing, too, you've noticed that um, it's the room, really, that has the bigger effect on extralization. So that, that was good. What, what, one thing that did strike me a little bit is um, the preference for I mean, it was a sweet and sour moment, but the preference for the, the dummy head HRTF versus personalized HRTFs, which is really, as you said, contradicts the literature. But when looking at the frequency response of those by the way, yeah, there, there was one totally off. But, I mean, yeah, yeah, and I think that is really primarily the reason why you, you might be getting those results. But it's also good to hear that um, that there is uh, uh, you know, some some good quality to the to the dummy head because. Uh, you know, we're all looking for a more generic or a general model when it comes to listening. Nature personalized HRTFs not never be viable. Um, how would you make this into a commercially viable product? 
Oh, well, there's, um, I, I mentioned on, on my document the NX from, from Waves. They're already doing it, and they have like a, an awesome system with a head tracking device. They send you the head tracking device, you put it on your headphone, and uh, you use it like that, but it, it sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the main problematic. People are really amazed by it, but they are amazed because, uh, because it's, it's pristine and nobody has done it before, but nobody would mix something in there. You cannot trust it. So using this approach with a system like that, I'm not thinking on designing the entire system because it's already designed by Waves. So it's sort of like something that has already been done, but this one is uh, it's uh, also backwards compatible in, in the sense that you can combine it with other enhancement approach. And it's already sort of like in the box because you put it on the EHRTFs. So it's compatible with any spatial system pretty much. Like it doesn't matter if it's a plugin for, for something or if it's an experience. You just have to put the spectral cure into the HRTFs. That's it. It works. Um, and then I have my main comment about your document wasn't the figure numbering. I know. Which was all over the place. Yeah. And so you really need to fix that because we had three figure fives or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So well, you really exactly. need to do that. And I have some other minor comments about your document. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it very much also. Uh, I also think it's very timely. Uh, you had a nice chart in the document that was in your presentation showing the, the engineer's curve versus a, a flat curve. Can you say more about what you were comparing it against? What's flat in that diagram? Sorry. So you showed the engineer had changed the response. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. So changed it with response to what? So he was, he was Th that change was reference to the real environment. So he was aping between the, the, the real system that the simulation was modeled after. And he was just pretty much doing a regular EQ, like if he was tuning, or not tuning, but like if he was EQing in a mixing session, a drum set, for instance. Uh, so he used the track uh, that was played through the simulation, and then it was played through the real speaker at the same time. So he would be able to, with one button, AB between those. And he would deliberately be modifying the spectrum to just match them. He would take some breaks, then come back to it, and, and do some more tweaking. Uh, so that's pretty much how this cure uh, happened to be. Mm -hmm. but, but the personalized HRTF curve is different from this curve. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and how did that one differ from, a, let's say, a normalized HRTF? Uh, Can no, you say something about how that was different from what a generic HRTF would have been? Oh yeah, I mean the, the thing the thing here is that there was some um, I would say artistical input in, in in that sense. So if you take generalized HRTFs, you pretty much get what you get, and and that's pretty much what I mentioned on on the measurement based uh, approaches, enhancement approaches. What you measure is what you get, and there's no really input into how to change it. Or I mean, there's a lot of approaches that just okay, take the curve, invert it, deconvolve it, and you get a, a flat line. But again, if that sounds terrible, if, if, if you don't get the results that you are expecting, there is no artistical insight on it. It is what it is. So in, uh, in addition to having personalized HRTFs as opposed to generic HRTFs, this curve gives uh, the engineer some sort of like artistical input into the system. I guess the reason I'm asking is I'm wondering if there's some kind of middle ground between personalized HRTFs, which are unworkable, and the generic ones in terms of Noticing what are the kinds of changes that people make. I mean, are there norm are there changes that are often made so that you can have a generic that is more like what people want? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there there, there are some approaches in, in that sense. Uh, for instance, uh, exaggeration of, of the cues. There there's a lot of studies in in uh, elevation. They just analyze which particular frequency changes with changing the elevation, and they just exaggerate that particular. Even the NX uh, the waves plugin that I talked about that when you measure your head and it adjusts this mathematically uh, mm -hmm. how with those HRTF sound because of your head size and uh, uh, whatnot. But uh, in, this, in this particular case, this curve is also compatible with that. So it could be definitely uh, embedded with, with that same thing. Okay. Um, what is the difference between naturalness and colorization and to what extent are they correlated? Well, Naturalness is more of a feeling of how realistic it sounds. Something could be, uh, for instance, if, if I listen to drums, uh, I could say, well, 
the kick drum sounds a little boomy to me because of the simulation. The, the, the uh, low end is accentuated. But it sounds pretty realistic. It just sounds accentuated. It sounds like a speaker is there playing an accentuated low end. But in the sense of, of, uh, of coloration, you could think that something is flat. It, it, the, the spectral quality is preserved, but it sounds fake. It doesn't sound realistic. It doesn't sound like it's coming from a speaker in front of you. That's what I meant by naturalness and coloration. I got that question from a lot of listeners, actually. <laughs> OK. Um, another question I had was about the nature of the stimulus that you gave the engineer, these sign sweeps. I mean, it would seem like that would be pretty fatiguing, first of all. And second of all, what, do you think you would have gotten different results had you played more ethologically valid stimuli? Let's say a drum set and then had them evaluate later against drums as opposed to these sign sweeps? Well, I mean, the, the sign sweep, I, I actually, all, all the stimuli were musical. Absolutely, all the stimuli were musical in the listening test. But uh, the reason I played uh, sign sweeps were only for the HRTS. So he pretty much didn't hear, it. well, he could hear it, but he had uh, the binaural capsules in. It was blocked ear canal, so mm -hmm. so he was just pretty much uh, with the laser on his mouth, moving his head around. Oh, okay. He was not testing for anything. The the tuning happened with instruments, musical content. Okay. The last question I have has to do with your conclusion, mm -hmm. where you say um, that you're talking about uh, virtual reality and reality reality. The transformation will be gradual, the constant. It will take some time, but it will occur. Reality will never be perfect, but virtual reality at some point will be. Um, with respect to what? I mean, isn't the purpose of virtual reality to be perfect with respect to real reality rather than the other way around? I mean, the, the thing, what, what I was thinking when I wrote that is, uh, for instance, if you compare a Neve console with an emulated Neve console, well, of course, the Neve console is just like the top of the notch in terms of, of, of uh, consoles. But the emulation of that is not only, it's not only keeping the sound, that same character, but it's also enhancing some features that people thought that, well, it's, it's just impossible to improve the sound of a Neve console. It's a Neve console. But you actually can improve the sound by adding some extra features. For instance, um, I'm thinking from the top of my head, MS. Add MS to it. That would never happen in the analog world, but it happens on, on, the, on you know, the virtual environment. So having a perfectly flat room it's almost impossible. And it takes a lot of money and a lot of support. But in virtual reality, you can have a flat room, a completely flat room. And what I mean is that you have actually a perfect reality, and uh, music will transform accordingly, in my opinion. Yes, well, you could argue that the not flat room is more perfect because it's more like what we experience without headphones. Well, at the end, it's a, it's a sort of like a, a mid process between the final user and the engineer. You're just trying to make the uh, engineer's life easier by, uh, you know, uh, getting a flat frequency response that ensures that it's going to sound at least decent in every single speaker around mm -hmm. the world or every particular situation. Okay. Uh, I get your point. I think you might re I mean, you might phrase it a little differently <laughs> just because it sounds like you're trying to improve on reality, which is sort of a strange concept. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> thanks. Thank you.
The title of my thesis is The Illusion of Oral Space and Motion in Film, an Examination of the Perception of 3D Audio, Visuals, and Content. So uh, the motivation of the thesis. Uh, 3D audio has become more popular in the last few years, especially in film and virtual reality. I do sound design for film and theater, so naturally I was inclined to see how I could incorporate it into my work, uh, both creative and technically. Now what I came to find is that the uh, two of the main said the two of the main um, two of the salient features of uh, 3D audio are the sense of space, spaciousness, and motion. Now, um, Wojciech found that louder audio enhances the perception of these two features, and Hamasaki found that the same occurs with the addition of speakers to a given playback configuration. Now, in terms of oral composition sound design, um, Sergei Eisenstein uh, has a theory, it's called audiovisual montage. And simply it states that um, um, it's a he looks into the ways in which visual and oral composition work together to elicit motion in a cinematic work. Um, so it seems obvious. Uh, it seems obvious that the design of the audio and visuals relates to the perception of the film, but I couldn't find an empirical study that verifies this or examine in what ways this occurs. Knowing how to work with 3D audio and film compositionally is important because 3D audio is still relatively new, and not a lot of filmmakers know how to work with it yet. So with this in mind, uh, the goals of my thesis are to determine if the perception of spaciousness and motion is dependent on the perception of content composition, and to determine if the size of the speaker configuration matters in this determination. I hypothesize that there's a relationship between the perception of content, spaciousness, and motion, and that a larger speaker array will enhance the perception of these uh, variables. So. Uh, to, to, to determine this, I have devised a subjective test that consists of uh, three uniquely designed film clips that are presented in two different size speaker configurations. There are a total of six variations, approximately two minutes each. A series of questions are asked um, about the clips presented. They are presented in two rounds to offset the need for a training period and in random order with replacement to minimize the effect of presentation order. Now, each case is uniquely composed of different technical and design parameters addressing audio, visual, and general content. Uh, technically, we have the two speaker arrays. Um, each case is designed in a, um, uh, a unique 3D, with a unique 3D recording technique. And um, other variables of consideration are to what degree does the film emphasize visuals and or uh, audio. Um, to what degree is there a sense of space and motion in the clip? And in content, um, they're all, each clip had, um, is created in a different genre and of a different visual audio production value. So um, the two um, speaker configurations tested are 7.0 and 9.0 paraphonic arrays, which are home theater setups in both Oral 3D and Dolby Atmos. Um, both, they're, both arrays are related. Um, they are based off of a 5.1 bed. 7.0 adds an additional um, uh, left and right channel in the heights. 9.0 builds on that, adding another uh, left surround and right surround in the, um, in the rear. Now the reason why the title of the thesis is called The Illusion of Oral Space and Motion is simply because designing in this format um, the audio uh, utilizes the phantom image. Um, and to do that, uh, there has to be an illusion. It's not actual full reproduction. So case one, um, clip A. Um, it's an action sci-fi film. It's visually driven. Production quality is high. Um, the space and motion emphasis, and it, it, I call it complex because there's just a lot going on. Um, it is designed with a 5.1 surround sound uh, reverb plugin. Um, all the audio is original, um, and it's upmixed using a generic upmix um, that uh, separates uh, unique sound from the ambience, and the ambience is placed into the heights. Uh, case three um, is a rom-com, 
that is actually dialogue driven, the production quality is low, and the spaciousness motion type is simple. There really isn't any emphasis of space or motion. Um, it's, the audio was created using dual MS uh, plus Z channel, and the way that works is that there is uh, one microphone uh, facing forward towards negative Y, and this, um, the M is facing towards negative Y, and the side is plus X and minus X, and uh, the other microphone is placed in coincidence on an angle, the M facing plus Y, and the sides uh, positive Z and minus Z. Uh, important to note is that um, although you do get information from the top and the bottom, um, there's only one there's only one side in the end that's actually used in the height, so it's technically monophonic height um, information. Now, uh, case two, clip B, uh, uses dual MS um, plus Z recording technique, but with worldizing. Um, worldizing was pioneered by Walter Murch in his film American Graffiti in 1973. Um, essentially, all it is is um, it's a, you take a dry signal um, which is uh, placed o uh, played over speakers and recorded in a given space. So in this, um, for this clip, uh, I couldn't actually, I couldn't be on set for, the, well, all, for all of it, so I went to either the same uh, recording space that the original audio was done in or a similar place and recorded in 3D um, in those, uh, uh, with the dual MS plus Z. The, um, content characteristics, it's a drama. Um, visuals and sound are evenly weighted. The production quality is also it's in the middle. And the spaces motion type are simple and complex because at some point it's simple and other points it's complex. So addressing um, the variables in the, the, in the case design, um, I've divided them into main effects and sub variables. Main effects are the, the main what I'm trying to figure out, the, the principal hypothesis uh, to determine the relationship between content, spaciousness, and motion. So the principal question is how engaging is the presentation, how involved in the clip for content. For spaciousness, do you perceive this clip as spacious, and for motion, is the motion natural or realistic? Now, um, there, the sub-variables include narrative style, so um, what is the perception of the dialogue, the visuals, and the sound? and also visual to audio weighting. So I'm measuring to what degree do we understand um, that the film was principally about visuals or was it principally about audio or in between. Uh, lastly, visual production value and audio production value are also uh, asked about. So the procedure, um, I analyze the variables um, cross case in between array. Simply what this means is that each variable is compared uh, against itself either um, to each case. Um, so vari okay, for example, variable one, clip A would be compared against variable one and clip B in cross case analysis. That would happen one array at a time. <coughs> and in between array analysis, uh, variable one in 7.0 would be compared against variable one in 9.0. Now to determine, I'd like to determine what the similarity is between um, the variable in each uh, case and then each array. To do this, the main effects are analyzed using a related pair sign test. Um, the sub-variables due to statistical limitations um, had to be done descriptively. Uh, I'll discuss the limitations a little later. Um, so there's also objective analysis that took place um, I recorded HRTFs of the six cases with the Neumann K100 dummy head, and um, parallel to what I was doing with the subjective inquiry, I measured the standard deviation uh, in gain and in content. And the content is done with gain normalization. Anything that isn't unique will be evened out in the normalization. Um, the technique, the statistical technique, used for standard deviations and normalized root mean square error. I also performed frequency analysis, which is just gain um, standard deviation, but by frequency bins of approximately 23 uh, hertz. So, cross case results. Um, so there are 12 subjects, a normal visual, vision and hearing, 
uh, approximately 27.5 years uh, old. Um, because all participants have a background in audio, they were um, analyzed as one group. Now what I found is that in the seven point array, uh, all inquiry main effects and sub variables, um, there was a similarity between the variables in clip A and the variables in clip B. In the nine point O array, uh, there was a large degree of uh, similarity between the variables in clip A and clip B. Um, in both rounds of testing, but there's no initially obvious pattern between the variables. Um, now, in ob objective results, um, interestingly, I find that um, ANC's audio are least um, deviant or most similar in both arrays. So, as we can see, there's a discrepancy, um, uh, well, very obvious one between the first one, we have A and B and A and C, and then a 9.0, this needs to be looked at a little better. So, using frequency analysis, um, I find I found that there was something going on in um, uh, the comparison, the STD of uh, A and C, and it occurred in the dialogue range. Now, even though the STD was close to zero, which means there was very little difference, uh, the, the frequency was were similar. The region had a lot of magnitude fluctuations. So, if you looked at it visually, there would be a lot of uh, up and down. Um, so um, I decided to treat this region as deviation as rather than similarity. Now the results, we have a table of similarities here. Um, at the top we have the main effects and we have the sub-variable results. And below we have the frequency analysis. Um, okay, so uh, as we can see, A and B is most similar in that all the inquiry um, in subjective testing agrees with that. Now, the reason why I, um, I believe that this consideration is valid is because the sub-variables of uh, narrative style and production value deal with the perception of dialogue and it also de um, and the, the, and to what degree the audio is good or bad. These two considerations, since we're in the dialogue range, make sense. Um, so uh, we're validated there. Now, if we look at our main effects, this, the, the hypothesis is that content, spaciousness, and motion, um, there's a relationship between them. And as we can clearly see in the 7.0 array, at least in terms of the similarity in game between clips, um, there's a very obvious pattern there. So, um, more specifically, um, okay, so dialogue was considered as deviant. Um, clips A and B, um, if you were to take the frequency analysis, analysis into consideration, A and C uh, was actually less um, similar by uh, a relatively large margin. A B was less uh, a than A and B, and um, B and C the same thing, but an even larger margin. So in the end, we see that objective results agree of subjective similarity. Uh, a and B is most similar, not A and C and subjective results are validated, leading to the conclusion that um, there appears to be a relationship between the perception of content, spaciousness, and motion. Now, if we go into the nine-point array, we remember that it, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's not as consistent as a 7.0. But if we look at um, similarity tests of gain, um, we find that the same thing occurred in the dialogue range of A and C. So we treat this region as deviation as well. Looking over here, we see that A and C is actually still the most similar uh, by a relatively large margin, um, uh, which I will describe. Uh, interestingly though, AB and BC are actually of approximately equivalent similarity. Um, so what we have here are two relationships, one, one where a and C is the most unique, and A and A, B, and B, C. <coughs> a, C is correct. We see that subjective results in the first round, or just in general, we have um, still a lot of A and B, which may be in line with um, the similarity of equivalency between A, B, and B, C. It's still incorrect, though. 
So we have to go a little further. Um, specifically, ANC still contains the largest degree of similarity by 3,400 hertz. And again, interestingly, A, B, and B, C are of approximately identical similarity at around 13.2 uh, kilohertz of similarity both. So uh, we have a question. Why A, B, not A, C, the 9.0? Uh, I believe it was done with probable cause. There's a reason behind it. Um, a and C should have been, if we uh, look at the original assessment, A and C should have been universally recognized. However, uh, there's still a discrepancy. And the reason I believe that uh, um, there has to be a reason for this is because uh, chance, the chance occurrence of this occurring is improbable because the 9.0 content was presented at the same time as the 7.0 content and it was done in random order. So there has to be a relationship. So looking at the first round of the 9.0 array, we notice that there actually is evidence for the uh, AB coupling. We see AB, BC, and AB. So it appears that the equivalency is uh, recognized, which if we look at the 7.0 array, AB and BC, there's a predominant, we have A and three of these, which agrees with the 7.0 array. So, um, with this taken into consideration, there's an indication that there may be a correlation in the response patterns between the arrays. Looking at the second round, we find that there actually is an inclination towards more objective um, uh, similarities. So, we, uh, comparing the frequency analysis, A and C is the most similar. We see that in motion, A and C is actually acknowledged now. But it's acknowledged at the same time as A and B. Now, the NAs mean that there was complete autonomy between cases in the variable. This was actually, as mentioned, built into the design of the clips. So that was recognized in content and also in narrative style. But um, what we see is that NA also existed in the first round perception and that there still is some first round perception in some of these variables. So the indication is that there's a move towards objective, understanding objective relationships, but there's still reliance on the first round. Generally speaking, um, as you can see, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, relationships here. In 7.0, we have only one. So um, 7.0 array is, it appears to have been taken uh, in holistic consideration whereas the 9.0 was reductionist. Each variable was uh, looked at separately or determined separately. So again, there, um, there's some overlap in the responses between rounds and that there's a general pattern towards a shift of um, uh, recognizing objective relationships, but um, there's still some incorrect re relationships that were perceived in the first round that kind of leaked into the, the second. Okay, so um, if we compare uh, rounds, um, we see that the objective similarities are clearly perceived immediately in the first round and unanimously in both. 9.0, again, um, objective similarities are moderately perceived, but uh, with some dependence on the first round perception. To me, this indicated that a training period was necessary. Um, so we have two primary questions now. Uh, why AB over AC in the first round, and why was a training period necessary in the second round? I believe the questions may have a common answer. Now, if we look at the differences, the objective differences between arrays, um, we find that uh, in A and B, the data suggests that it's easily recognizable, and there's only one similarity um, set. In 9.0, we find that A and B and B and C is one set of coupling, and it relates to A and B because it uh, is included. As we notice, it's recognized in the first round, but it's weaker objectively than A and C, um, the, but the data suggests that it's easily recognizable. A and C, not related to A and B. It's a lot stronger objectively, 
only partially rec recognized in the second round. Data suggests that is not easily recognized. But if we look at it again, we find out that this has two sets, that has one set. Um, a and B exist in both arrays. So um, my conclusion is that A and C was just very hard to perceive at first due to the prevalence of A and B. Um, additionally, because two sets were um, perceivable uh, uh, in the in the 9.0 array, um, the participants may have gotten a little confused initially. A training period is necessary um, because, well, there was confusion. Uh, evidence for this is the subjects did not agree with the coupling in the second round and moved towards the observation of objective relationships. Um, the perception, but there was still the perception of the first round uh, relationships. So even though there, even though um, there was a heavy reliance uh, on the on the first round perception, by the second, we're moving a little uh, away from it. In the end, um, my assessment is that maybe a little more training was necessary due to the complication, or rather the convoluted uh, similarities. Now, um, the findings are preliminary due to statistical limitations. Um, I couldn't do qualitative analysis because, um, well, yeah, the statistic, um, because of the statistical limitations, namely that I only had 12 subjects. I should have at least had 20, maybe 25. Yeah. Um, One more minute. Okay, I'm almost there. Um, I, I believe that the uh, correlations are, uh, can be validated but other variables should also be considered for cause and effects, and uh, many unanswered questions, principally, why did all this occur, which I can't determine in, this, in the current study. Uh, lastly, um, very, uh, to me very importantly, probably the principal finding is that um, the findings suggest a new line of thinking in the role of gain. Uh, previous studies have focused on uh, gain variance, so um, the louder the audio, um, the better the perception is what uh, Wojciech found. In this one, we're comparing similarity, and there seems to be some pattern there, and so should be uh, considered in future work. Um, just very quickly, between array results, um, no statistical findings, and uh, I believe it could have been done, um, happened uh, because of a number of reasons, but again, uh, all this needs to be validated. So, um, in conclusion, the uh, the findings are preliminary. Um, I feel that there's solid indication that content, spaciousness, and motion can are related. To what degree, I don't know at this point. And um, future work will just will uh, work on uh, well getting more subjects. Um, the the study was uh, very large uh, in design and scope, so it needs to be narrowed down. I'd like to focus more on content uh, and the relationship of video and audio and perception. And finally, um, another uh, for another time, I'd like to look into gain similarity more. That's it. Thank you, Chris. Um, this is a very interesting topic and uh, one that is very relevant. And uh, I find that your uh, your written document and also your presentation is now much more focused than it was in your last presentation in, in the summer. And um, so you've done a lot of good work uh, in that. Um, I have a number of comments on the document, but uh, let me just first start off with the, question, the questions. Um, so you say uh, in your document and also in your presentation that the training uh, factor was, or the lack thereof, what kind of training or what kind of instructions did you give to your to your subjects? Uh, I don't remember specifically. Um, well, in terms, uh, just to quickly start off, and the fact that um, it appears that similarity um, occurred um, uh, in game, it, I don't. It shouldn't. The fact that the fact that I feel that the 7.0 and 9.0 were considered at the same time shouldn't have occurred because what I asked was that each um, clip be considered separately. I mean, naturally, that's not going to happen. Um, 
it's uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble think, remembering the exact instructions right now. Because what where, where training becomes really important is yeah. we want to eliminate the effect of a, a novice uh, subject where the responses will be different at the beginning of an experiment versus at through the end of the experiment. So right. we go through a training period to kind of eliminate that. So did you, in your, when you were looking at the, uh, at the results, did you see a difference in how the subjects were responding? So did you see the effect of training on your, on your data? Well, yes, well that's exactly, the, in the 9.0 array, that's, that's what I saw. The initially, it seems like um, everyone uh, was a little confused. Um, and by the second round, we see that um, uh, the 7.0 array was still had there was still the same perception of the 7.0 array, but a 9.0 were more close were closer to objective reality. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I'm analyzing round one and round two again has to do with the statistical limitations. It was not my original intention. Um, it was just basically trying to figure out uh, what findings are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. On page 40, and this is something that you didn't uh, touch upon here, you say that you cho chose the film clips based on three criteria. Those were genre, um, the narrative style, and the film quality. Well, how did you determine those three criteria? Where did you get those? Um, I'm sorry, one more time. So, uh, uh, genre? Genre, film. narrative style, and film quality. Those were, you say that those were the three criteria that you used to select the film clips, and why oh. did you select those three criteria? Okay, so um, genre, uh, well spe specifically, I, I know some people are, you know, maybe they're a sci-fi buff, um, so their general perception of a sci-fi film will be more, will probably be more positive than it would be the type of genre they hate, maybe they hate rom-com. Mm -hmm. um, narrative style, there are also preferences in, preferences in that as well. I know some people hate movies that are just all talking. Some people love movies that have a lot of visuals. Um, so that that's why that consideration was uh, taken in. Um, and the film quality, I think that's just the general. You know, if it's if it's technically poor, that may affect your perception. I've seen amateur films that. I didn't like because the visuals or audio were okay. bad. Well, you, you need to, in your document, you need to specify the reason uh, why you chose those criteria. Because uh, when I read this, I thought, well, you know, there are, there are other possibilities of reasons why you want to choose certain things. Um, so it either has to be based on you know, some previous studies that were done in this area, or if you have those specific reasons, those have to be listed in your document. Um, and then, uh, I mean, the, the whole point of, of your thesis here is to look at space and motion. Now, when you when you describe the type of motion that was in those clips, you define them as simple, or you, know, you give very quick identifiers to the motions that were in these three clips. Right. But what is simple motion? How do you define simple motion? Um, the, the way I define simple motion uh, is by uh, two parameters. One, um, the number of things that are moving at once and the other one is simply speed. <laughs> um, okay, well that has to be defined because just saying that something has simple motion doesn't really mean uh, a lot to, to the reader. Um, you have to base it on, on some very specific criteria. So if you say a few things, are, how many things? Is it one, two, three? What, what defines simple motion? Well, what, is, what are the different types of motions, categorizations? And I'm sure there's been a lot of work done in the in the literature that kind of look at motion as a parameter that quantifies motion. And I urge you to look at some of that literature to really um, have these more quantifiable identifiers for motion than, uh, than you have. Um, I have some comments on your, on your document. Um, when, whenever you have a figure in the document that it comes from another source, you have to make sure that that is stated. Or if you redraw a figure from another source, say that this is a figure taken from this paper, uh, like all the localization blur graphs that you have, those are taken from past. That should be so in the caption, not just the beginning. That should be in the caption, yes, yeah, yes okay. absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, we have a lot of more 
Um, I've been sitting here, so I'm kind of going off of your presentation more than the document, but I guess my main question would be, how did you, you keep referring to objective reality in terms of the similarity between the clips. How did you compute object, what's objective reality here? Okay, I, that was a poor choice of words, I suppose, but objective reality is simple, uh, simply the HRTFs. Um, so it's specific to the, by the dummy head, his ears. So not everyone has the same set of ears. So that's why reality is a poor choice of word. Um, the calculation uh, was done basically, uh, we're in the digital realm. Um, the audio was analyzed in both the time and frequency domain first. And then uh, I did a calculation of normalized uh, root mean square error between uh, audio files, which was done by sample and also frequency. When it was done by frequency, it was done by an average um, because the clips are not exactly the same length. They, they deviate a little bit. Uh, the other thing is, um, if you're doing a comparison of audio that's not the same, um, you know, what's the point of uh, doing it in the time domain? It's not going to line up. Um, well, so all of that makes me question why you think listeners were wrong. You keep saying that when there were nine speakers, they were more likely to be incorrect than when there were seven. But you know, what you were doing is different from what they were doing. I mean, your, your, your measure of reality is one thing, but how, I mean, maybe they're right. Maybe, you know, with nine speakers, what they hear is more accurate in some way. Well, the reason I don't, I mean, of course, everyone, they, they could, they're right in one way, and I believe they're wrong in another. To have in the 7.0 um, uh, such a, a credence in only one set, and then in the second one, to really be all, all over the map. Um, I guess what, what, what it hinges on, which is I believe you're getting at, is that uh, I performed the same operation in, um, to the, freak, the dialogue range in the STD in 7.0 and 9.0, and I, I probably glossed over this point even with that consideration, it, um, the AC um, comparison was still largest by far. And even if I didn't do anything to the dialogue because I was doing it in the AC comparison, AB and BC would have been of approximately equivalent similarity. So those are the facts I have, and everything else is an inference. So you always played this, so all subjects heard seven and then they heard nine. No, they, they, well that's, they, they heard seven and nine um, in a random order. Okay. So there, uh, there were three cases and six, there were six variations randomized done in two rounds. Because you were suggesting before that you thought that, that listening to seven first might have given them some habituation effect. If they were used to hearing AB, so that's why I carried them. But if it was random, then that wouldn't be the case, right? Uh, yeah, I, I apologize for that. Um, I'm, I'm nervous, so I didn't state that correctly. They, I believe that rather than 7.0 being first, that they recognized that first and more predominantly than they did anything in the 9.0, right? And that influenced their decision making in 9.0 when it occurred. And because their everything was presented in random order. Um, <coughs> It doesn't seem probable that these patterns should have uh, arisen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, you can't you can't make a conclusion of saying it doesn't seem probable. I mean, you have to follow up what the data said. Okay. You're fine. Um, I, I, okay. Good. So, what would be your next step if you were going to do this again? You would pare it down. You said what? What would you focus on? What would be your simple experiment? Um, my simple experiment, uh, again, I'd have 25 subjects. I, I bring it down to just one case. Uh -huh. um, I, well, it's, I think I, I wouldn't focus on the arrays. That's basically proven. Don't need to deal with that. Within the one case, um, if we take away the similarity, uh, gain similarity, that's another uh, topic. I just run the experiment again, which is one case, keep it very simple. Um, even though I would do it in two arrays, it just, ev everything was overly complex and I believe that my questionnaire was just too big. Mm -hmm. I'd already cut it down, but it, it was, I think, three pages for uh -huh. each thing, so. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
Just wait a few minutes. Sure. Hello everyone, my name is Marcus Zacharia, and today I'm here to present to you my thesis study which I've conducted over the past year, uh, which is in regards to digitally recreating three photograph playback forms for wax transfer cylinders. And uh, I first became interested in this topic when I took a course a year ago in history and preservation of early sound recordings, and I remember hearing for the first time about Thomas Edison and these wax cylinders, and more specifically, I remember hearing about all these various phonograph horns of different sizes and shapes and compositions that affected the sound. And I had a spark at that moment that how cool and how interesting would it be if I could capture impulse responses of these horns and apply them at first to my music or music from this time, um, Spotify or Tidal, wherever you have you. Um, and as I went along with the course further and further, I learned about the audio preservation efforts that were being done in the field and uh, the techniques that were being used to do that. And I realized that by taking impulse responses of these phonograph horns, I could actually be contributing to a bigger field as opposed to just my own music or music of this sound. So before I get into talking about all the processing that went on and all the techniques, I want to give some background on what my title actually means and what this era of music was. So digitally recreating three phonograph playback horns for transferred wax cylinders. Well, what are wax cylinders, and what does it mean to transfer a wax cylinder? Well, a uh, picture to the left are wax cylinders, and they're the earliest commercial medium for sound recordings. Um, in, 18, in 1886 and 1887, they were actually made out of wax, but the wax cylinders that came afterwards were made out of metallic soap compounds and not actual wax. 
And the reason they're still called wax cylinders is because of their appearance. And when these wax cylinders are recorded, you can see on the photo to the right, this is a microscopic shot of the actual physical grooves, the physical signal being recorded into the wax cylinder. So when I'm talking about transferring wax cylinders or what a transfer wax cylinder is, it's essentially moving this content from one domain to another domain. And in recent years, with the growth of digital technology and digital systems, when we talk about transferring cylinders, we talk about digitizing them and bringing them to the digital domain. So why do I want to digitally recreate uh, playback horns for these wax cylinders? Um, well, to get more into that, we need to know some background on the phonograph and what it actually did. Um, the phonograph was uh, invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison, pictured in the top left. And at first it used tin foil as a cylinder medium, not wax. But 10 years later, it started to use wax. And how a phonograph playback works is as you, if you can recall the grooves in the previous cylinder, as the cylinder is rotating on a phonograph, there's a rounded stylus which rides the undulations of the cylinder. And it's attached to a diaphragm which vibrates sympathetically with that stylus. And then these vibrations are further amplified through a playback line. And that was one of the most important parts of these horns. It was to amplify the signal, but they did more than that. These horns added their own acoustic characteristics and resonances to the sound. And furthermore, due to the technology being used during this period, uh, when the stylus rides the, the wax cylinder, there's a lot of uh, high-frequency noise that actually gets filtered out by the playback system, by the horn, and by the reproducer. So going back to transferred wax cylinders, as I mentioned, we bring them into the digital domain. And when you're using modern technology to bring it to the digital domain, you're also copying all this high frequency noise that is incurred through the surface uh, contact. So the reason I wanted to capture impulse responses of these various horns was not only to apply their acoustic characteristics uh, to these recordings, to these transferred cylinders, but also to remove a lot of that high frequency noise, which doesn't sound as pleasant, and to provide a more authentic listening experience to these transfer cylinders as they were listened back at the turn of the 20th century. So in order to record the impulse responses, in order to get the files that I needed to do this processing, I broke my procedure up into two sections. The first section uh, was a wax recording and transfer set, uh, session in which I generated eight different audio test signals using MATLAB, and they were recorded onto a set of five brown wax cylinders. The second session, since I was trying to capture these horns' acoustic characteristics, I would use the cylinders which I recorded and play them back through the horns and record that output. And with that, I would have all the recordings needed to do the processing. <clears throat> so the first session uh, took place on July 16, 2016 uh, at the Thomas Edison National Historical Park. Um, and I, for the session, I had uh, brought five brown wax cylinders, which I purchased from Richard's Laboratories, as well as a Genlec 8030A near field monitor, uh, a MacBook Pro with Pro Tools, and some other gear. And I brought it to this museum where I met the head museum curator, Jerry Fabris, who not only helped me by letting me use this wonderful facility with all this technology in it, but he also provided his expertise on recording and transferring cylinders. And he was the engineer for both of those sessions as well. Prior to recording the signals onto the wax cylinders, there's a few steps that have to be done to ensure uh, uniformity amongst all the recordings, as well as solid recording. Uh, first, the brown wax cylinders, as you can see in that picture, were warmed with a portable lamp to 80 degrees. This just ensures that the medium is softer and you can record into it. Secondly, the RPM was measured with a NICO tachometer, and it clocked in at 160.1 uh, RPM, which is the standard RPM post-1902. And this was done to, again, to carry uniformity throughout all the machines involved in this recording process. And lastly, uh, the first wax cylinder was used uh, just for measurements and to test that there was any visible distortion that happened to the diaphragm during the recording process. So to give a better idea of the phonograph operation and phonograph recording, uh, here's a brief video of recording one of the audio signals from the session. And in it, you'll also see Jerry Favors performing something that's known as swarf duty. When you're recording into these cylinders, you're physically scooping out shavings of wax that could interfere with the record. So it's necessary to have someone 
remove the wax with a with a with a, a blowing mechanism or a brush so that nothing interferes with the record. There we go. was done for all five of the cylinders and once these cylinders were recorded this, the second part of this first session was to transfer them so a few hours later the cylinders were brought to the preservation facility at the Tung Citizen Historical Park uh, where Jerry Favors used his archaea phone at that facility to transfer all the cylinders into the digital domain um, for those of you who don't know what an archaea phone is it's a modern piece of equipment it was a uh, developed in 1998, and it's designed to transfer any phonograph cylinders from 1889 onwards, uh, even some in the most fragile conditions, although there's other techniques done today as well. So once the cylinders were recorded and they were transferred, I could do the second and final recording step in order to get all the recordings needed, which was a playback porn recording session. Um, this session took place on September 17, 2016, in this building actually, actually on the sixth floor in the research lab. And the reason that that location was chosen was because of the semi-anechoic characteristics with it behaves uh, with. And to get a better idea of the recording setup, it was done as so. Um, it was used captured with six microphones, six earthworks and 30 microphones, which have a flat response. And uh, two microphones were placed close to the horn, one directly at the mouth and one by the flare. Three microphones were placed at a distance of 50 centimeters away, and they were never moved throughout the entire session. And one microphone was just placed as extra analysis at the far back of the room, just for more analysis for future studies or whatever have you. Um, these six microphones, uh, again, were just to see how the different frequency characteristics behaved in the room. But for the actual convolution and impulse, gener uh, impulse response generation, only the uh, that microphone was presented in the paper. So let's get a better idea of the playback horns that were actually used in this study. The first playback horn recorded was a pedal horn, 33 inches, and hawthorn and shovel. And for the scope of this presentation, this is the only horn that you'll see and hear the results of. And that's just because the processes that were conducted on this one were conducted for the other two that I test. And the reason that I chose to select this horn was because hawthorn and shovel uh, at the turn of the century again. They were the largest horn aftermarket manufacturers, at one time offering more than 100 different types of horns. And this horn was beautiful, I purchased it as well. So uh, when I saw it, I had it included in my collection. The second horn uh, I recorded was from the Searchlight Company and it's also a pedaled horn, 29.5 inches. And the reason I included this was it was from another major horn aftermarket manufacturer. And I was interested because I came across an ad which said it was based on the scientific principle of a searchlight reflector. And they were boasting about that. So I was curious to record it and see how those characteristics actually looked. And the third playback horn I did uh, conducted was for what's known as the Edison Witch's Hat. And it's a conical 14-inch uh, horn. And this was the first type of horn to really ever be uh, sold with machines in 1896, these 14-inch horns, and they've become a standard for a lot of those types of machines. So, now that I had all these recordings, I had my cylinders transferred, I recorded the cylinders, and I had the horn recordings, I used MATLAB to spectrally analyze all the recordings, and more importantly, I could analyze them in each domain, in each process they went through. Um, here's only the 10 second sweep out of the eight audio signals that were recorded on each one. Um, this is just one of the signals. And as you can see in the digital domain, when it played from the speaker, there's no noise. It's just, just a sweep, a clean sweep as you can imagine. And then once they were recorded on wax cylinders and transferred, there's two big things that happen. First, you incur all this broadband noise uh, throughout the entire frequency, as I talked about with transferred cylinders. And secondly, you see a bunch of these harmonics which aren't prevalent in the digital. Um, a reference recording was taken also at the wax recording session and it was deemed that these happened at the recording level so they, that's why that's where they uh, entered 
uh, factor. And then after the transfer, that cylinder was played through a playback horn, two further things happened. Firstly, the noise floor is greatly reduced to four, uh, till 4K with some tapering happening within 6K and such. And secondly, you see these horizontal resonant bands in the surface noise, which are the horn's characteristics on the sound. So from these three profiles, the essential goal of my thesis now was to create an impulse response for the playback horn that was generated by deconvolving either the digital file or the transfer file from the playback horn. And in order to compare its similarities and how effective it was, I would reconvolve that impulse response with the transfer cylinder and observe the spectral similarities between the actual playback horn and the convolved recording. Now this sounds straightforward, but there's several impeding factors that come into play. The first one's mechanical noise. We're dealing with antique machinery that runs with a motor and uh, clockwork-like mechanisms. So as you can imagine, when you're trying to relate different frequencies and analyze frequency signal and you have this noise masking what you're trying to talk about, it's going to skew your results and it's going to skew your accuracy a little bit. The second impeding factor was time variance. Between the recording stage and the transfer stage and all the different recording sessions, um, there was time variance which happened between each one. And what this did is, one, it made it very hard to align uh, the files to see where each one began and their lengths were different as well. Additionally, it made it hard to find out the cutoff points or the response of the horn, like how long did it take to decay, because in some cases the horn responses were shorter than the initial input, which shouldn't happen. So, to combat these, to combat these impeding factors, I prepared the recordings several ways so that I can select the best impulse responses for the signals. Um, firstly, since I recorded eight audio signals, I tested several of them to see which would yield the best results for an impulse response. And to combat the time variance issue, I additionally time aligned them and I time stretched all the files so that I could try deconvolving them from both the transfer and the digital. Additionally, to try to lower the noise in the files, I had recorded some of the sample noise and I tried to use Isotope's RX5 denoise feature to uh, lessen some of the noise, but even at, at its lowest settings, um, some of the horn characteristics were still being picked up, so I couldn't do that. And lastly, because of the mechanical noise and time variance, um, it was hard to hear the cutoffs, as I said. So I, I tested all these files at a wide range of cutoff times, decays, to find out when did the horn actually die out, or what was the best representation, what cutoff led to the best representation. So once I had all these recordings processed the way I wanted to, I decided to analyze them using two criteria. The first criteria was a spectral comparison, which is what I sort of talked about earlier, just visually comparing the similarities between the actual horn recording and my convolved result. And the second criteria came after, the spec came after I had initially come up with uh, criteria one, the spectral comparison, and it was aimed more at just listening to the results, and more importantly, listening to the sign sweep, not the surface noise, because that's random. I just want to listen to the actual characteristics of the sign sweep. So in criteria one, we have the actual horn recording to the left, and we have the cylinder that was used to play that phonograph on the right. Um, the, best, the best impulse response that I generated, leading to the most similarities, was when I deconvolved the 30 second sweep from the horn recording, uh, from the digital sweep, and there was the impulse response length was 6,000 samples. And when I took that impulse response and I convolved it on the transfer, I was presented with the following spectrum. So as you can see, the noise floor is greatly reduced to about 4K2, and even a lot of the horizontal resonance bands that are characteristic of the horn have been implemented. Um, it's not perfect, it's not 100% accurate, but it's similar. So to hear how this impulse response sounds on an actual transferred cylinder or on music, I decided to convolve the impulse response on a, the intro to an Itali Italian opera cylinder, uh, which I got from the UCSB uh, cylinder audio archives. And you can see both uh, spectrograms here. And what you'll hear first is the transferred cylinder, and then you'll hear it convolved with this impulse response. So.
So while I was happy with those results and how they looked visually, when I listened to the sign sweeps comparison, one thing was different. And it was that the, the, the sign sweep I had generated uh, from just a spectral analysis seemed to be a bit more reverberant than the actual horn recording. So I wanted to try this a second way with a shorter impulse response length uh, that would maybe make the signal a bit more dry. But when I did that and I convolved it, there was a lot more high frequency surface noise. So in addition to that uh, processing, I also put a low pass filter that modeled uh, the phonograph playback system. And the low pass filter was to 6K with some tapering at 4K. And this was the result when I convolved the same signal, so 30, the 30 second sweep of the horn recording from the 30 second digital sweep using a uh, impulse response length of 340 samples and a low pass filter. And this was the result. As you can see, it's not as similar as criteria one visually, although there's some, some uh, remnants of those harmonic bands and the noise floor. But this was just another criteria aimed at giving a different analysis uh, because, because of the masking and the time variance, these both are different compromises on the recordings that I have. And to hear how this uh, impulse response sounds on the same song. some of the resonances overall a drier signal but um, this one used a low pass filter where the other one was justified. So to conclude my thesis at the end I had presented two sets of three different impulse responses which could be used to convolve on transferred cylinders and in regards to future work I plan to contact online collections that play these transferred <laughs> cylinders such as the UCSB uh, Cylinder Audio Archive and the Library of Congress National Jukebox I want to talk to them and just see if they would offer these impulse responses as a possible listening option for their collections. Um, furthermore, this paper serves uh, as analysis for future related studies. Anyone looking to capture impulse responses of phonograph horns either using wax cylinders or novel techniques without wax cylinders finding different ways to drive them, they can all benefit from the analysis in my paper. Furthermore, there were limitations which I encountered in my paper, um, such as using two phonographs and not doing, all the not doing all the recording in an anechoic environment. So my own study could be optimized, and this paper serves as extra analysis for people who wish to take on that task. And lastly, this uh, thesis serves to just raise awareness for the au ongoing audio preservation efforts. Um, it's, it's a field that definitely needs as much awareness as it can get, and these wax recording mediums are degrading day by day, as well as the equipment that's used to record them and play them back, especially the recording horns are in very fragile condition. So it's important that we bring awareness to these audio preservation efforts now before it's too late and we can never preserve these mediums again. Thank you. Congratulate you on excellent work. This is such a fascinating topic, I think, to, um, to a lot of the community, uh, especially at a time where we're, as you said, we're just gaining awareness in this field and these recordings are degrading. And, um, so capturing the, that medium and capturing those recordings is, is really important. Um, I really enjoyed reading your thesis and um, have a couple of questions. My first one is when you show the what, what you call the impulse responses, mm -hmm. wh which are really the spectrograms of the sine sweeps. Yeah, so yeah, those, correct. those yeah. are really the spectrograms yes. of the sine sweeps that you recorded. So my question to you, why are you showing, and it's very difficult to see, I mean, I can kind of see the, the differences between the two, and some of the differences are quite stri striking, others are less striking. Yeah. Um, why not show the transfer functions? Yeah, well, the way, because I think part of it was because of how I came to, to these results. I had to analyze these recordings in a multitude of ways, and the way I, I uh, analyzed the success was always through comparing them, through convolving them back onto the transfers and observing the similar characteristics. So when I was presenting the topic, the reason I 
chose to show the sine sweeps instead of the transfer functions was to show the impact of the, of the response on a transfer cylinder as opposed to just the transfer. So can you describe to me the process that you went through to go from the, the sine sweeps that you recorded yeah. onto the cylinders mm -hmm. to extracting the impulse response? Yeah. So, uh, so I recorded a suite of, of signals, some meant for analysis, some for the impulse response on these cylinders, transferred them, uh, got the horn recordings, uh, played them through the phonograph, received those horn recordings. And then um, the first thing I did is I prepared the files uh, a lot. I had time, because of the time variance and those other factors, I first had to time align and time stretch all these files. And once they were aligned, I tested them at multiple cutoff rates because I couldn't hear the cutoff. And I used the deconvolution function in MATLAB to deconvolve the horn recordings from both the transfer and the digital to see how they both uh, Okay, okay, so you took the sign sweep recording. And yeah, then several signals, but the sign sweep the was sign one of them. recording oh, and yeah. the other ones, and then decon using the MATLAB deconvolution function, yes. deconvolved it with the original sign sweep signal. Correct. To get to get the information. Ah, okay, that wasn't clear to me because that's that was one step that yeah. I was missing in your in your document. Okay. <coughs> Maybe I miss it. Yes, okay, you know what might be really interesting um, to to show in addition to to this because I agree that this has some information that mm. a, just a transfer function, the, the the frequency domain may not have, uh, is to also show the transfer Definitely. function because that would give us uh, and also to show the comparisons of the different transfer functions of the three different cyl cylinders that you have, or the, the three different horns mm -hmm. that you have on one plot so we can clearly see the spectral um, differences between those three horns that, that you have. Okay. Um, so I urge you to uh, do that. Also, and but you clarified it here, it wasn't clear to me at which microphone we were yeah. looking at. There are uh, nine? There's six, There's six, six microphones. And, um, uh, and so you showed the, the diagram here of where the microphones yeah, are located. I did, I did and here in your presentation, that became clear. Yeah. Um, but in your document, that wasn't clear. So I was always questioning, which one was it? And why is it that you chose to study the one that was at 50 centimeters? Why yeah. is that? Um, well, OK, so initially when I came up with this study, and I'm trying to find the slide here, but I don't think I will right now. So initially when I was uh, doing the study, the reason I used six microphones is I, I hope that after I had recorded these impulse responses, I could actually mix them together like you would a concert recording and kind of mix the low end from one microphone by the flare with certain other room microphones and get this more well-rounded picture. But after I saw all the impeding factors, I decided to just use one microphone for this study and to generate the impulse responses for that just because this, this test has never been done. And the reason I use this middle microphone um, I've gone back and forth on that. I could have used the close microphone for a more close capture, but I use this one just to kind of have more of a, a listener's perspective, a distant perspective, and not be so close to the resonances that might have been right in the horn, because those might have not made the cylinders, the transferred cylinders, they might have made them too resonant. And as you heard in the convolved response, you're already fairly resonant. So that's why I ch chose to use a, a slightly further uh, microphone. That microphone. Okay. Um, sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that this is a, a wonderful thesis, and I'm so happy to, to see, you know, such, such great work, um, you know, for, for basically making the playback of these transfers more historically accurate, you know, because we listen to these flat transfers and, and we lose that experience of, of hearing. So I think this is really worthwhile work. I just want to ask, how did you determine the gain level of your test signal at the recording stage when you were playing them back through the Genelex. How did you determine that? Um, well, I'd actually referenced your study. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when I did it, I used, uh, I test, well, the first wax cylinder recording was recording, and I tested a series of one kilohertz tones ranging from uh, softer amplitude to louder amplitude. I tested a range, and as we recorded on the cylinder, uh, Jerry, myself, and also a fellow grad student, Spencer, was there to analyze if any distortion occurred. And we tested the cylinders again. We tested the signals in a wide range of volume, and we never heard any distortion. So what we did is we just found a sweet spot of, uh, before any of the room was getting excited, because the room we were in was a live room, and you could hear certain right. things 
rattle and resonate. Um, so we just found, since there was no distortion, we had lowered our level from that maximum point we found. And uh, from there, we set our signals at that level. Because I think that the, the number of harmonics that are present kind of um, show that perhaps it was a little too hot. The yeah. signal was a little too much because in, in, in my study, um, there was only one harmonic. So I, I think that for, for that could be compensated for and that it does kind of show in, in this um, Italian reporting that you do the, the, the process for. But that's also um, the you know the nature of wax cylinders. Some are, are loud, yeah. so you know you will get that resonant coming from horns, and you, you know that from listening to horn yeah. recordings. Um, and I just want to ask, what were the compositions of the horns? Were they brass or tin? Oh yeah, you know? um, yeah. So the, the Edison witch's hat uh, was brass. Yeah. Um, um, sorry. <laughs> Edison, I'm gonna stop playing slides. Edison witch is mm -hmm. was brass. Uh, the Hawthorne and Shovel was brass, but it. Uh, it could be a mix with aluminum, two and tin, and the searchlight horn was aluminum and tin, and it even yeah. sounded very tinny when you heard it. It, had, it was different than both of the other horns. If you had a bigger budget for a research project like this, it would be so great I to, to yeah. test on <laughs> mahogany because yeah. that sounds the richest and the best, and then you know compare that with metal and glass, which was also a popular horn. Yeah, um, and then uh, my. I think my I have a million questions, but um, <laughs> one of them is why the choice to use modern cylinders that were created by Richard's laboratories rather than um, historically aged original wax cylinders? Yeah, so that has to do more with the contacts I had and the communication I did. Uh, at first I was going to get period uh, cylinders and I was going to shave them down and use those but some of those contacts fell through and I wanted to get my recording process started. So after I had talked to Jerry Favors from the museum, he re recommended me to these two separate people, uh, both who specialize in making these brown wax records uh, based off uh, previous articles on how to make them. And uh, yeah, so that's why you use them for mm -hmm. accessibility. And just because you mentioned the horns too, at first I would have loved to uh, record or record horns of different compositions. That was the goal, but they're much harder. And as you said, with budgets, much harder. Yeah, because I, I think if you're planning on, on making some kind of um, playback system for an archives website, yeah. for example, like you could do, you know, hear this recording played back through a signet mahogany horn, yeah. or hear it played back through a witch's hat. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, so that would that would be great. And um, for the for the comparisons, you play a flat transfer versus yeah. the convolved yeah. signal through your system. Mm -hmm. And then I'm wondering why you don't also play through an actual uh, recording of a, of a cylinder played through a playback system to hear if it matches an accurate yeah. inaccuracy with the yeah. system. Yeah, uh, the reason I didn't do that was just because the transferred uh, cylinder I had, I got from the archive, so I didn't have actual access to the cylinder to play and record, but uh, yeah, in, in future work I could uh, find a cylinder that was both transferred and has a horn recording. Yeah, if for example, if Jerry does a transfer yeah. for you of a cylinder and then you apply your convolution to that mm -hmm. and, then, and then record it in 3D playback yeah. through the horn and the system. And then run that through an impulse response of the music room yeah. in you know in Edison's lab. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just future work. So. Yeah, no, that would be great. Okay, that's all. Do uh, yeah, we have a couple minutes. Sure. Um, first of all, congratulations, great work Thank and uh, wonderful presentation. Um, um, so my question is, uh, how do you envision people using this in a library somewhere with headphones or yeah. on a speaker? What um, do you see? Um, Headphones or speakers, for me, doesn't matter too much. How I envision it is just on these online cylinder collections as a, a drop-down feature, maybe implemented through a web-based plugin that you can just listen to the cylinder, click like, I want to listen to this through a witch's hat 14-inch horn, uh, click the drop-down menu, and it changes, filters the output to the, the witch's hat. So, okay, so, so you had a mono source and you chose to use a mono microphone, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I think if that were reproduced through a mono speaker, it would sound quite realistic. But through stereo, uh -huh. 
Um, I don't think it's going to work as well because now you have two mono signals. They're colliding in the room, and we have two ears, and yeah. you have a little bit of um, an issue there. So my suggestion is, well, my first comment would be uh, to have taken stereo responses also. Mm -hmm. um, instead of a mono, if, if your intended playback is through two channels, through headphones or through two speakers, yeah. uh -huh. then it would have made sense to have done a dual impulse, but that's okay. okay. You can fix that. And um, uh, to tag on uh, Professor Feinberg's uh, comment about you know matching playback, uh, I would go one more step and play back your your product through very good speakers with the phonograph in the room mm -hmm. and tweak it by hand. Just fix the equalization, mm -hmm. use um, Ozone has a lovely stereo thing. Yes. Just tweak it okay. to make it sound as good as it can because this, there's no reason to be purist about it because the mm -hmm. system is flawed. You're dealing with impulses, you're dealing with microphones, you're dealing with preamps. Yeah. Um, and hanging off of Ernesto's <laughs> work, um, you know that that last step is really important, and it will make uh, make it more successful. Because what people, what, what we heard sounds like, yeah, you got the you got the um, energy, but it didn't sound beautiful. <laughs> and yeah. uh, but you're not far from that. I think with a little equalization and some patch up before you present it to anyone else. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. Yeah, this was definitely a, a purist approach. But that would be in your in your playback device. Yeah. Or uh, I don't know how you'd fix that. You'd re. I don't know, once you get those settings, I don't know how to implement it back in, mm -hmm. but I would, I would go for that. Okay. And in fact, you do have the stereo responses. You have of the, the horns. Of the horns. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, with the multi multi yeah, multi multi yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so Thank you. much.